I'd like to invite everybody to take their seats so we can get started. And um, before we do, just that reminder to turn off your cell phones for the evening. Uh, welcome to the Lafayette Library and Learning Center. My name is Sarah Blumenfeld, and I work for the Library Foundation. The foundation, along with the Friends of the Lafayette Library, raises about 60% of the operating budget for the library. We meet our challenge with ticket sales for tonight, sponsorships, and with the generous support of our donors. The library, we like to think of it as being more than just the bricks and the books. It's a gathering place for people to come together. And we're really pleased to be with you tonight for a special program with, hosted by one of our consortium partners, St. Mary's College. And this is part of the um, St. Mary's College program, MFA program in creative writing. St. Mary's is one of 12 East Bay institutions that we partner with to bring programs to the Lafayette Library. I wanted to make just one program note. We have a program tomorrow night with author Joyce Maynard. She's gonna be here, she's a longtime friend of the library and she'll be holding a program on the art of authentic memoir. And it's a free program, it starts tomorrow night at seven o'clock. We do have some flyers in the lobby and I know this is an audience that might be interested in something like that. Um, before we begin, I also want to express my gratitude to Candice Eros Diaz and Sarah Mamolo. Yay! Uh, you all know them. Um, I've really had a great time working with them to bring this program here, and I really look forward to uh, having the chance to work with them again on another program. And to get the evening started is um, the faculty director, Matthew Zapruder, and he is going to tell you a little bit about our speaker tonight. And the interviewer. So thank you for coming to the Lafayette Library. Matthew. Hi, everybody. I'm actually not going to tell you anything about our speaker tonight. Um, I'm going to leave that to Juliet. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to thank the Lafayette Library so much and the community of Lafayette for welcoming, welcoming us. Um, it's great to be partners with our, our um, fellow uh, residents in Contra Costa County, and um, so we're just thrilled to be here, and it's a beautiful space, and thanks so much, and uh, welcome to everybody from the community and from our program. Um, very briefly, the most important reason I'm up here is to ask you to silence your cell phones. That's my main function as director of the MFA program. <laughs> um, so please do that. You know, you don't want to be that person. Um, so as I said, thanks to the library, and thank you to Sarah Blumenfeld and everyone who's helped this uh, come together. Thanks as always to the board of the St. Mary's um, MFA program uh, and thanks to Scopus for providing the wine. It's good that we have wine. Um, before I just very briefly let you know who's coming up to do the real work tonight, um, I just want to say that uh, it's the 20th anniversary of the St. Mary's College of California MFA program. Uh, for those of you who don't actually attend the MFA program or are here, we have a great, a wonderful creative writing program that's housed at St. Mary's College, and it's our 20th anniversary, as I said. And uh, we're very proud, and it's, we're having a lot of great programming, uh, public events that are free and open to the public. And actually, the next, so, and you can pick up one of our flyers that um, there's some back there um, that, our, that our lovely friends from Orinda Books. Are, uh, where you can also purchase um, the title, uh, Christina's title tonight. Um, they have some flyers. I saw some also outside. So please take one because we have some uh, world-class writers coming. Our next um, reading actually, which is on campus at St. Mary's, is Gregory Pardlow, who won the Pulitzer Prize this year for poetry. A very exciting um, Pulitzer Prize winning, as I said, uh, poet who's just a wonderful guy. And, and so I encourage you all to come check that out. and future readings that we have. So I think that is it for me, other than to say thank you to Juliet Kincaid Black, who's going to do the introduction for Christina Garcia. And we're just thrilled to have Christina reading tonight. And she's also teaching in our program this year. And we just couldn't be happier to have her. So I'm going to welcome up Juliet and get out of the way. So thank you. Can I use this microphone for right now? Okay, great. Um, so uh, on a side note, when I was in the MFA program myself a really long time ago, the Lafayette Library had just opened in the building that we're in now, and I 
came and wrote a lot of my thesis here, so it's really nice to be back and not under such enormous stress. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for helping support St. Mary's MFA program as we celebrate 20 years of continued dedication to and education of writers and the craft of writing. Uh, it's such a special program, and your support is so needed and so welcomed. It's my privilege this evening to introduce an author and teacher I first met my second semester in the MFA program. Christina Garcia was a visiting fiction professor that semester, and when I learned who that teacher was going to be, I emailed my Mexican mother and to discuss, you know, what, what do you think Christina Garcia is going to be like? And my mother said, she's going to be mean. All Cuban women are mean. <laughs> Imagine my surprise and my delight when I, it turned out that my fiction craft teacher was this warm, genuine, very generous soul who was as committed to my work as she is to her own. Through reading her work, through discussing the craft choices of other authors that she admired, and to learning how to read my work with her, I learned about rhythm and syncopation, the texture and tapestry of the story, and most importantly, resonant endings. Christina is the author of six novels, including her latest work, King of Cuba. She has edited two anthologies and written two books for young readers, a young adult novel, and a collection of poetry. So we can all just give up trying to live up to that. Her work has been nominated for a National Book Award and translated into 14 languages. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Writers Award, a Hodder Fellowship at Princeton, and an NEA grant. Christina is the founder of Las Dos Brujas Workshops, which organize multicultural conferences in New Mexico, Florida, and the Bay Area. She has taught at universities around the United States, and this year is a visiting distinguished fiction writer in residence at St. Mary's, teaching creative nonfiction and fiction. Uh, both, maybe. Please join me in welcoming a woman I am honored to call a mentor and a friend, Christina Garcia. That's so beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, is it okay if I just sit here a little bit more informally? Thank you, Juliet, um, for that lovely introduction. Thank you so much for having me here on this balmy Wednesday evening um, in October. Um, I, uh, I think I'm going to read primarily from uh, King of Cuba, but I promised a few of my students who are here that I would also read from work in progress. It only seemed fair <laughs> after that. They are so uh, vulnerable, open themselves to, to uh, criticisms with work in progress, which is a very brave thing to do if you, if you can imagine that. Imagine trying to serve something just half cooked, you know, and, and expecting people to anticipate what it would, what it might taste like 30 minutes from now, uh, um, except that it might be two years from now when their novels are done or their stories are polished. And so it, it, it's, a, it's an act of audacity, uh, delusion, and bravery to, to do that kind of thing. So, um, uh, but I will start off a bit with King of Cuba. The, the book is, um, is essentially a fictitious portrait of El Comandante, Fidel Castro himself. And uh, in counterbalance with one of his many nemeses, an octogenarian uh, exile in Miami who basically is hanging on, waiting, waiting for the son of a bitch to die. You know, it's like this back and forth of that generation of men who in many ways represent uh, the polar opposites of the so-called dialogue about Cuba and, and Cuban Americans. Um, but the story is also interspersed with a, a lot of other voices, interstitial voices that happen between the chapters or in footnotes or in asides that skewer, contest, confound, complicate the official histories that these men represent. So I thought I would read a little bit, maybe, I'm not sure yet who, uh, which of the two men, um, yet whom, um, and then, but maybe read the voices, because those are the voices that we don't hear from so much uh, in the public discourse, that are not heard in the shouting match uh, 
between Cuba, uh, Cubans on the island and Cuban Americans, uh, primarily in the exile. Oh, I'm seeing some old faces. Hello. <laughs> um, but um, one of the fun things for me in working on this book was trying to imagine uh, Fidel Castro at all stages of his uh, all stages of his life, not just when he marched into the capital from Oriente. Uh, in 1959 and began what is the kind of long, longest running um, regime in, in history, almost in history, in contemporary times, but uh, trying to imagine what he was like as a boy, what he was like at that Jesuit school where he was a, a, a little bit kind of socially outclassed, um, his relationship with his brother, um, his, his um, he was born actually of a relationship between his father and uh, the maid. This is before Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, <laughs> you know. And so he always had a bit of that chip on his shoulder. And they all, you know, he was raised un in this under the same roof uh, as his half brothers and sisters. But um, but anyway, one of the things, um, you know, in the very opening, he's, you know, he also is, you know, in his late eighties and and very preoccupied with his legacy and and you know and he's he's basically railing to nobody um about uh who's got like the biggest cojones the biggest pinga on the island do i have to translate that no <laughs> so he has a bit of a flashback uh oh and i'll just read that flashback it's very short i'm going to just read little bits of tapestry so you get a taste of the of the the book rather than long sections. And this is for Juliet because she requested this. <laughs> the tyrant recalled his first vision at age four of Papa's prodigious pinga, steaming like a locomotive after a hot bath and flanked, but maybe I shouldn't start with this section, <laughs> but <laughs> the hell. Um, we're all over 18, okay. The tyrant recalled his first vision at age four, Papa's prodigious pinga, steaming like a locomotive after a hot bath and flanked by grapefruit-sized balls, or so they seemed to him, that hung confidently, hirsutely, where his thick thighs flared. That same evening, as his mother bathed, bathed the little despot-to-be, taking care to wash the pink butt of his manhood and dust it with enough talcum powder to make it look like a lump of sugared dough, he worked up the courage to ask, Mommy, will all of me grow? His puzzled mother had helped him into his calzoncillos before it occurred to her what he was asking. Ay, mijito, your pinga will be the greatest in all the land, <laughs> in all the Americas perhaps in all the world. The boy was cautiously pleased. Okay, the greatest, but will it also be the biggest? His mother grinned, eyes shining, and brought her lips so close to his that he inhaled the garlic from that night's ajiaco stew. Don't you doubt that for a second. The pint-sized tyrant's chest filled with pride, and he strutted off to bed with big dreams, the biggest of all. He imagined his pinguita growing and growing until it floated high in the skies, a massive flesh-toned dirigible, draped with parachute huevones and a proud snout that served as the control room for the whole impressive operation and that nobody not even the Yankees with their warships and gun batteries would ever dare shoot down. Good night, mi amor. His mother kissed him on the forehead and gave him an encouraging pat. Sleep with the angels. Good night, mommy. And with that, the pint-sized tyrant rolled over and fell deeply, happily asleep. <laughs> Okay, so we're off. <laughs> we're off and running here. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, so, so I have to say, uh, it was, it, I think it took me all these 20, 25 years to kind of work up the courage to tackle Fidel in this intimate kind of way. In my very first novel, Dreaming in Cuban, he's there as a leader, but more of a distant figure, someone 
you couldn't approach, a little bit like going to see the wizard or something. But here, uh, it was a real immersion program for me to, to, get, to get in his bloodstream, to kind of see him in all his complexity, to see him as a man flailing and frustrated at the end of his life, feeling kind of mis misunderstood uh, with enemies all around. Uh, when I was writing it, my, my daughter, who's now out of college, she would come home and say, you know, you're getting a little authoritarian in, you know, in your old age. You know, like I'd be <laughs> come out of a day of working and I'm like, porque lo digo yo, because I said so. And she's like, where, where, where's my mo mother? So there is a sense of, uh, you know, when you, you write your characters that you totally, uh, you have to immerse yourself entirely. You have to know so much more than whatever en then ends up on the page. Um, um, I thought maybe I would read a few of these little voices too. Um, one of the things, initially when I was writing the book, I was just going back and forth between these two titanic figures and, and I thought, oh God, I, I'm being asphyxiated. These are the men I've been avoiding my whole life and, and here I am writing about them. And so I decided to go back to Havana, this is in 2011, uh, for about a month and just to kind of, I hadn't been there in a while, my grandmother who died at the age of 102 had died um, you know, 10 years earlier and I hadn't, hadn't really been back and, and it, for me it's very important and it's the old journalist to me, I'd like to get on the ground, hear what people are talking about, singing about, complaining about, you know, just, just that kind of reportage I think that yields those details that make a story come to life. So the first thing I heard uh, when I landed in Havana was that all the coffee makers were exploding across around the island. And what, I said, what? The coffee makers are exploding? And, and so this, this came out of that. And there's all these different voices. This is from a caffeine addict named Areceli Modragon. By the way, I try and do Cuban accents, but I lived in Texas for five years, so I'm sounding a little Tex-Mexy now, uh, I'm told. But all right, we'll go with it, café. As if my nerves weren't already shot. Now the coffee makers are exploding all over the island. The government is distributing this half-assed café mezclado made with chickpeas. Chickpeas? The mixture clogs up the coffee makers, heats up too fast, and pacata. Already two people have died. A viejita in Pidal de Rio lost her hyperthyroid eye. And I don't know how many others have been seriously injured by this latest descaro. Not to mention the holes and purple blotches on everyone's ceilings. I, for one, prefer the blotches to my old peeling paint. I swear, this must be a part of a larger conspiracy to keep us down. How can we protest or organize against the state when we fear for our lives making coffee? This is terrorism at its worst. Who must terrorism? I'm going to put the flame on low and head out to the garden and wait. If it blows, at least I won't go with it. So there's a ton of those crazy voices throughout. Um, I might read another one of those. Uh, oh, I'll read, I'll read you a section that is absolutely true. I didn't have to make up a single thing. It's a voice. You want to hear that one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, in Cuba, I often found myself saying, why do I have to make anything up? <laughs> if I just record it, it would be more than enough for fiction, except often I found myself having to rein in the reality so that it would be even remotely plausible as outlandish fiction. So this one is called Galapagos, and it's utterly true. And this is by um, Mita Artist, but she was an artist. This, okay, no more preamble here. This is a very difficult country, very stressful. No quieren reconocer que esto es un fracaso, an utter disaster. I waited years for an apartment in Havana until I couldn't wait any longer. I built my own place in between these two old mansions in Vedado. It's gloomy and narrow, but I shift a spotlight around to where I'm painting y me resuelvo. And then there's a footnote with resolver, to resolve is Cuba's national verb. 
This could mean anything from resolving a cake for Anissa's quinceañera to resolving the revolution's over-reliance on import. At first, the authorities considered me a squatter, and they tried to tax me out of existence. But I parked myself here and refused to move. I live with my kitty and a baby Galapagos turtle that a friend of mine smuggled out of Ecuador. Sometimes I take Piquito to the park so he can sun himself. They tell me my turtle will live 300 years and grow to the size of a Volkswagen. But what's the use of worrying? Nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. If you chuck Piquito under the chin like this, see? He bobs his head. I love that. My paintings, naturally, they have a sinister air. They're my hallucinations, my nightmares. Right now, I'm working on a series called Buscando Carne en La Habana, looking for meat in Havana. Meat, of course, in all respects. It's these disgraces that I'm driven to paint with my medieval palette, one disgrace after another. There are never any shortages of those. Um, so this was actually an artist I met who had jerry-rigged basically a tree house between two homes. You know, she talked to the neighbor on one side, talked to the neighbor on the other. She paid them each a little bit of money. She siphoned the electricity off from, you know, from the pole. And, um, and there she was uh, with this, and the kitty and the, and the turtle ate from the same dish. I don't know what was in there, but they were happily munching side by side. It was astonishing. Like, why would I have to make up a thing for something like that, right? All right. Um, let's see. What else can I read for you here? Um, there's a scene where um, El Comandante, who hates to travel because he likes to be in control always, uh, he goes to visit um, a fictional Ga Garcia Marquez, who's called Babo in this book. Uh, and so he, he shows up on a rainy day in Mexico City and heads off uh, to this uh, very fancy apartment building that has guards everywhere. And, uh, and uh, Babo has a quite a glamorous wife named Gloria. And so uh, El Comandante shows up with his wife, uh, who at one point uh, he describes her as having the good-natured sincerity of a puppy, his wife. Um, but anyway, so I'll just read part of that section. It's a few pages, just so you get more of a scene scene, okay? So he, he meaning el comandante, trailed Gloria, the wife of Babo. He trailed Gloria down a dim corridor to Babo's study. It was here that his friend had insisted on spending his final days. He wanted simply to die surrounded by books. There were no family photographs, no souvenirs of his travels, no sign of his Nobel medal or snapshots of him with the great men of his day, the tyrant included. Just books, his and others, Babo's eternal friends, and a vase of hyacinths on the nightstand. El Comandante approached his friend cautiously. He was relieved that Babo was alive, but afraid that there was nothing left for them to discuss. In their heyday, their conversations had lasted for days, interspersed with fishing trips and the reverential hush that accompanied their smoking of fine island cigars. There were a few subjects they hadn't broached, analyzed, laughed over, and argued about, all the while growing fonder and more admiring of each other. Not that there hadn't been a thorn or two. Once, Babo stopped speaking to the tyrant for months over a rust-colored beauty they'd discovered on a visit to El Cobre's foundry. She was just Babo's type, too, pure, liquefied, mulata, sugar. But at the last minute, the tyrant chose her for himself, pulling a revolutionary droit de seigneur. Every now and then, the incident rippled through their friendship like a Cuban water snake. Nonetheless, Babo had proved as savvy about politics as he was at writing about the darkest recesses of the human heart. It was a rare combination in a man of his accomplishments, and there had been a time when the tyrant had envied his friend's gifts. 
In truth, his envy still flared on occasion. But Babu's unfailing good humor, his generosity toward the revolution, and his unflagging personal loyalty to El Comandante had won him over. There wasn't another soul on the planet, see Fernando, that's El Comandante's brother, whom he trusted as much. Hombre, what are you doing lying there like a beached whale? Babu opened his ruby eyes and cracked a half smile. That initial spot on his lungs had developed into a tangled web of ailments impossible to unravel. As the afternoon light faded, Babu's surprisingly small study filled with shadows. Night's arrival would console El Comandante, at least until his exhaustion began to feed his paranoia and worsen his mood. Hijo de puta, Babu whispered, his grin widening a quarter inch. Did they tell you I was dead? The pale light gleamed off the side rail of his bed. It seemed to El Comandante that something in the room itself, in the shelves of thick, silent tomes, in the collection of vintage typewriters, in the fountain pens arranged in a perfect arc across Babo's desk, seemed charged in some charged in some imperceptible way. His friend's breathing grew labored, deliberate, as if he had to concentrate on it fully. A nurse who reminded the tyrant of his mother, dark skinned with sinewy legs, held a handkerchief to Babo's mouth until he expectorated. Carajo, you look almost peaceful, El Comandante choked. That's something we vowed never to become. The old friends coughed companionably. The nurse poured each of them a glass of water, which their respective wives helped administer. All this love, and we're still powerless against death, Babo said regaining his composure. In the end, I want to leave behind something imagined, not simply recalled. The tyrant couldn't have disagreed with Babo more, but he was in no mood to antagonize him on his deathbed. No, he would much rather reminisce over his lurid, manic, garish, heroic, lived life than dwell on anything that even the great Babo could conjure up. It was action that fueled his ideas, Elira thought, not the other way around. It was a man of action, <clears throat> action and appetites. Facts paralyze, his friend continued, a disconcerting rumbling emanating from his chest. Imagination frees us. El Comandante grew impatient. But what good is imagination without action? No history is made, no lives are changed, worthless. He registered the discomfort on his friend's face. You deliver words, I deliver action. Words are action, mi amigo, as compressed and devastating as any bullet or caress. Babo said with surprising vigor, what do we have left except, he paused, the adventure of language between two wrecked ships. Carajo, everything you say is invention, the tyrant countered. Couldn't I say the same of you? Son of a bitch. If Babo weren't so sick, El Comandante would launch into one of his infinite tirades. Instead, he sulked. Have we forgotten how to laugh at ourselves, Babo chided? Then this must be the end. The two remained silent for a moment, neither wanting to surrender to the other. Finally, Babo blinked and changed the subject. These days, I prefer the language of rain. He's been praying for rain, Gloria interjected. The tyrant turned to her. And what have you done about it? About what? She inspected it, her fingernails. The rain? Mi cielo, they're in a drought, Delia po protested. That's his wife. Haven't you been listening to the news, Gloria? Did you know we have the worst meteorologist in Havana? This is your husband's last request, and you haven't found a way to grant it? El Comandante, el comandante demanded. But jefe, how can I? There are machines that can make rain. I can stand on the roof myself with a fucking bucket so that he might. <laughs> Don't get upset, Bobby. This isn't something you can control. Delia flushed with embarrassment. The obdurate bells of Mexico City announced six o'clock, echoed by the grandfather clock in the hall. Socialism or death? What was the damn difference? 
Bob will remain placid in his bed inhabiting the hour. Then, pink nostrils quivering, he requested his daily ration of chocolate tapioca and dispatched every last wobbly spoonful with enthusiasm. Visibly weakened by the effort, he collapsed onto his pillow and closed his eyes. Perhaps he was traveling back in time to his childhood, to the river journey with his grandparents that had marked him forever. The tyrant felt faint, though his heart beat wildly. Delia held a vial under his nose that smelled of Fernando's prison disinfectant. I'm going to just skip a little for ahead here for time. Drowsiness enveloped the tyrant. He didn't want a nap, but his body overruled him. With Delia's help, he settled himself in an overstuffed chair by Bobo's bedside, sank his head to his chest, and like his friend, fell asleep. The two snoozed together, leaving their wives to freely ignore each other. An hour later, the men awoke with a start almost simultaneously. The evening sky was hazy, reflecting the lights and smog of the city. Babo and El Comandante were pleased to find themselves still in each other's company. The moon dies with the night on its back. Babo's face creased with emotion. I thought I had dreamt your visit. I'm no dream, the tyrant said, pressing his tongue against his palate, nor am I ready to repent or regret. Babo laughed a weak facsimile of his laugh. His mind was shorn of most wordplay, but his emotions remained fierce. You're the only son of a bitch who came close, he said, quoting himself. To the monarch of the word, El Comandante retorted, holding up an imaginary champagne glass. In the spreading darkness, the old friends surrendered to the ordinary happiness of being together, oblivious to the sounds beyond the study, the ringing telephone, a faraway television, the ticking of the grandfather clock, the few drops of rain moistening Bubbles' windowsill at last. That's all I'll read of that. <laughs> Um, so if we still have time, can I read a little bit of work in progress? Yeah, it's not too long. Um, anyway, this new book um, came, uh, emerged from a three-month sojourn I, ha I had in Berlin. I went thinking I was going to write you know, and do research for uh, one book, and then I ended up writing an entirely different book. And this book is a compilation of uh, many different voices who are all telling their stories in one way or another to this unnamed visitor. Um, and so this is one of um, maybe 40 different voices in the sections vary in length. I guess it's a collection of short stories, but with tangled roots. Um, and um, and uh, so this one is uh, Sophie Echt, and it's in Berlin. It's, con it's set in 2013. And sometimes um, the, this visitor, unnamed visitor, will comment. And she does here, elegant in her widow's veil, she exuded more confidence than grief. And so this is Sophie telling her story to the visitor. I was buried in a church graveyard for 37 days, but wasn't dead myself. Not buried exactly, but ensconced in a sarcophagus, the contents of which had been disposed of by my husband. This happened in the middle of the war. Now it is I who am burying my beloved Yuba in the same churchyard cemetery where he'd hidden me. I'm not sure where to begin, my dear. If there's anything I've learned from studying Russian literature, it's that you can't rush a story. The sarcophagus belonged to W.F., a coal magnate who designed and erected his final resting place while still in his 30s. He died at 79. Fortunately for me, W.F. had been a giant of a man and built his marble tomb to match. Four men of average stature could have rested in its confines quite comfortably. Even so, how could I have imagined sleeping inside it for a single night, much less inhabiting it for over a month in the late spring of 42? My husband had the good sense not to propose his plan ahead of time. Instead, he presented it to me as a fait accompli. I had managed to stay enrolled at the university. Nobody yet knew of my Jewish grandmother, though the Reich frowned upon advanced education for women. The goal for German women then? To become baby factories for the fatherland. 
Regardless, I concentrated on my doctoral thesis, which focused on the comic skewering of social class in Ivan Goncharov's 19th century masterpiece, Oblomov. But when Germany attacked the Soviet Union the summer before, all Russian-related research, scientific, political, and literary, came to a halt. My husband saw the portents long before I did and busily prepared the sarcophagus. He'd been fretting over the intensity of the purges at the university, had heard rumors of labor camps and massacres in the forests of Poland. When I thought Juve was in the library studying for his medical exams, it turned out he was chiseling air holes in the tomb through which he expected me to breathe. He furnished it with what he could, a flashlight, moldering pillows, a woolen blanket, books of Russian poetry, Akhmachova, Mandelstam, Satsaya, assorted comestibles, sausages, Falkenbrot, dark chocolate, and a tin waste pail. When at last Juve showed off my new quarters as if it were a cozy, cozy cottage, I cried, have you gone mad? The next hours were impossible for him as he tried to bring me to my senses. My husband was a reliably rational, unflappable man. He later became a brain surgeon of some renown, but as daylight broke and I still refused to hide in W.F. sarcophagus, he threatened to kill himself. Only then did I climb to the bone-chilling tomb. You have promised to visit me every evening under the pretext of walking Friedel, a plump ball of fluff we'd inherited from our deceased neighbor downstairs. He brought me the day's news, urging me to remain calm while he arranged our transit out of the country to England, he hoped, where he had professional contacts. To straight bystanders, it would appear that my husband was talking to the dog, which dutifully held up its paw for scraps. Two days after my burial, the authorities came looking for me at our flat. Juve told them that I'd fled without warning. That first night in the sarcophagus was the longest in my life. My lungs burned for oxygen as I traced every centimeter of the tombs with my fingertips. Though I shivered, my skin felt scorched. I tasted the burial dirt. The cries of nocturnal birds tormented me. Better to die running, I thought, than like a rat in this hole. Had I been strong enough to push aside the marble lid, reading novels, even Russian ones, hadn't prepared me for this. Juve, in his genius, had secured it from the outside. By the time my husband returned the following evening, I was hysterical. Shoot me, I begged. If you love me, kill me. But he refused to open the tomb or remove my weight. Rightly, he calculated, it would take me several days to settle in. The second night was worse than the first. The stink was asphyxiating, time an incalculable weight around my neck. The trees soft without diction or pity, the bones of the dead mocked me. Try as I might, I couldn't concentrate long enough to read more than a line or two of poetry. What did poetry solve, I thought bitterly, when people were suf suffering? When my husband opened the sarcophagus on the third evening, the rush of air overwhelmed me. I tried to run, but my legs buckled. My clothes reeked as if I'd been living in the woods all winter. I sobbed, dazzled by the immensity of the starry skies. Yuvis spoke to me as if I were a child, rocking me in his arms. A few more weeks, he whispered. Isn't that worth it, to spend the rest of our lives together? By the fifth day, my anguish began to subside, and I forced myself to tackle one modest task after another. I pulled my hair back like a rope. Stooped over my flashlight, I memorized Akhmatova's poems, translating them into German in my head. 21st, night, Monday, silhouette of the capital in darkness. Some good for nothing, who knows why, made up the tale that love exists on earth. Oh, my dear, I grew well acquainted with my elemental self. The dimming of my eyesight heightened my other senses. The feathers in my pillow felt familiar as if I myself had coaxed the geese into relinquishing them. Tightly wrapped in my blanket, I pictured the bleeding sheep as they too surrendered their wool. I dreamt of trees and their skyward branches, the tangled rhizomes of nameless plants. In that icy marble lung of a tomb, I rationed my breath until, appear until it appeared as diaphanous as a veil. 
When I found it impossible to sleep, I pressed my lips to the air holes, sucking what I could from the spring. Toward the end of my entombment, though I didn't know then it was nearly over, I woke up to find the grass snake stretched out against my leg. It was my sole company for days. I suspected something dreadful had befallen my husband and grew frantic with worry. I scratched at the tomb's walls until my finger bled, knocked my <clears throat> till my fingers bled, knocked my head against its unyielding marble, anything to stop my thinking. The little snake wound itself around my ankle, first one and the other, gazing at me for hours with a common hypnotic stare. I knew they appeared four days later. He was hobbling on a broken leg, the result of a bad fall off a trolley. Cheerfully, he offered me a basket of strawberries and some pfeffer -keza. After we ate, I coaxed him into the sarcophagus. No matter his injury, my hunger, our fears, we made love as if for the last time. At the very next day, our passage to England came through. We escaped. Our journey? Ah, oh, my dear, that's a story for another day. Suffice it to say that my darling Yuba succumbed to two affairs during our long marriage. Betrayal? No, no, no. I quickly forgave him both transgressions. It was the least I could do for saving our lives. Thanks very much. <laughs> mm. So I think we have a little Q&A time, right? And uh, um, we'll talk, Juliet, and then we'll open the question, open the questions to the audience, right? Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> that was wonderful. I'm so glad that your students managed to coax you into reading some of your work in progress. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a little bit before you started reading about what it was like to write about El Comandante. Um, and that it had taken you 25 years to get to a place where you were ready to write about him. Um, this is totally out of order, so I'm going to have to go back through. <laughs> oh, uh, I read an old interview that Tris Abani had done with you, and he wrote this, I mean, beautiful kind of love letter of an introduction about um, your friendship together and how much he admires you. He likes my black beans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> essentially, that's what it boils down to. <laughs> he did mention those, <laughs> lovingly. <laughs> um, but he, there was this one sentence that, you know, of course, had me hungering for more. That talked about some of the struggles you had, um, y some of the the difficult interactions you had had in the past because of what he called um, a general non-engagement in anti-Castro activism. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and when I was reading King of Cuba, it really struck me that this is, in so many ways, a kind of activism. So I was wondering if you could talk about a, a little bit about that 25-year journey for you to come to write about him. Sure, yeah. Um, well, the thing with King of Cuba is that I, I feel like I, ta I tackle El Comandante, but I also tackle the other side as well, and it sort of equal opportunity skewering, you know. I, I just like making fun of Cuban men. It's <laughs> just a little hobby of mine. Um, so they're kind of irresistible because um, what, I, what I found, which I, I knew and suspected and had seen in all, all of these years, that there's really a kind of false dichotomy between the two. The reason, to a large extent, that there's been this unbreachable rift, I mean, there's many reasons for it, but Part of the reason is because they are of the same ilk, you know? They depend on each other, they're fused. Um, and uh, I can't tell you the times I would watch my mother yelling or arguing about something and she looked like El Comandante. She looked, you know, she did the same movement, she, you know, just pursed her lips. I mean, it's just like it's all the same genetic sludge, you know, and stew. And so, and so, um, for me, it, it wasn't a question, oh, I'm ax, you know, I have this ax to grind or I'm, you know, a, I'm pushing any kind of activism in one direction or another. I, I feel that I want to lay out the terrible feast and you can de decide for yourselves. But 
but my job, I feel, as a, as a novelist is to do these characters justice, to capture them in all their crenellated um, complexity, uh, warts and all, and, 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 and have someone that you feel is coming alive and walking off the page at you. Uh, I mean, just to have someone be an extension of your own political agenda, for me, it has a sort of a flattening effect. It's not interesting to me. Um, we were talking in class today about perpetrators, and that's our exercise for next week. But um, how do you, how do you, how do you render them fully? Um, uh, because if we can't look in the mirror and see the perpetrator in ourselves, uh, that that's a lot more dangerous, I think, than always identifying with the victim. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but um, perfect. <laughs> Um, I was just imagining because you you talked, y you even spoke tonight about immersing yourself in your character and having to know so much more than ever winds up on the page, and to immerse yourself in the research of um, all of those characters' lives, the their weaknesses and vulnerabilities as well as you know their strong sides, and do it well is really something that I admire so thank you I think <laughs> you have to have deep empathy you know e even for those characters you wouldn't necessarily want to hang out with mm -hmm. <laughs> or go to dinner with or anything but you still have to you still have to em embrace them they, they, they still have to become a part of you yeah. for so much of, of King of Cuba they are both um, Goya and El Comandante are struggling with uh, the human condition and their advancing age and death and dying. What in what ways did you get to explore your own um, thoughts and relationship with the human condition? Well, I definitely felt, um, since I was writing about octogen late octogenarians <laughs> um, with various ailments, uh, that I definitely felt that hot, hot breath of mortality. I still do, and I think it's um, made me, I don't know, it, um, I heard Russell Banks once say that every good book makes you want to change your life. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think writing, uh, writing a book also makes you want to change your life. There's something in that process that creates a kind of seismic activity within the self, um, partly because you, see other narrative possibilities, partly because you're, you know, inhabiting other characters and you're and you're striding even imaginatively in the world in a in, in new and different ways. And it's kind of in infinite the possibilities. And so um, so yes, I for one thing I can mention is that I've always wanted to take art classes and I've started taking art classes and have built a little studio. And um, and and that's something I've wanted to do since I was a kid and um, and and got into art school in high school and couldn't go to couldn't go to art school because my parents thought that that was I would develop a heroin addiction you know by <laughs> sophomore year so um, so all these things that you know suddenly you you do that you've put off for fifty years mm -hmm. or however long so so I don't know every 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 book I write also makes me want to. Um, enhance my own possibilities in the world. So. What kind of painting are you doing? Oh, don't ask. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, I'm just playing around. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, ma maybe I'll ask you one more and, s and then we can open it up to the okay, audience. Okay, sure. Start sure. thinking of your questions. You participated in a Litquake panel recently. Yes, and you were there, uh, Julia. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was there, and I was really moved because it, while you were speaking about your book and your experience of writing a novel and your own aesthetic, I was also really inspired by the role you took as a mentor, even among your fellow authors. Um, and I have had the benefit of having you as a mentor myself. And 
I'm really struck by how natural that role seems to be for you, and I, I can only guess at the importance it holds for you, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, who some of your mentors were and how that role came to be one that you yeah. lived. Probably my, um, my, my biggest mentor, I consider him a kind of godfather, is Russell Banks. Um, uh, I met him at a very uh, crucial juncture uh, when I was, um, I was still a journalist. I was a journalist for almost 10 years, my 20s into my early 30s, and, um, and decided to take um, a big leap and go to this uh, writing colony for a month. And, um, and I think I may have mentioned this in class. But for the first two weeks, um, I submitted the opening of this novel to, to one writer. Russell Banks was in the second half, you know, the last two weeks, and uh, was, oh, I, excoriated is not the word. I was, I felt like I, you know, I was, if pitchforks were p present, you know, it would be, you know, that was the equivalent, pitchforks and let's get her feeling. And uh, it was very demoralizing to say the least. And then in a kind of a, perverse uh, uh, act of experimentation, I decided to submit the same exact piece in Russell Banks' uh, session and got the exact opposite reaction. And he was extremely encouraging, and I ended up with his agent and so on, and he just sort of looked after me for a number of years. I could always go to him to ask him questions, whether they were about um, kind of publishing questions, literary questions, book recommendations. He was extraordinarily generous. And so for me, he was, he was like the gold standard for how, um, how one can be, how uh, I, I learned so much from him. And so to me, that matters enormously. I mean, we're in community. We work solitarily, but we are in community. And what we do is, is, um, is, is not that easy. It's, it's, it, you don't come home or you know, at the end of the day, what are you talking about? I mean, if you were not writing a novel, you'd be carted off and, and like this, you know, <laughs> like, oh yeah, well, I think I killed that person or well, well, well you know, but then I brought him back to life. Uh, you know, you're hallucinating for hours a day. So, so it's good to have other people who have been there and who are going through that and who are coming up against all the kinds of roadblocks and, um, and, str and struggles and to be encouraging of that. So, um, you know, we're nowhere without our stories. We're nowhere without our narratives. Um, so and without other people to encourage us in those narratives. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we'd love to open it up to the questions that all of you have. Who wants to be the brave soul who saves the day? The what? <laughs> oh, you know, not personally. <laughs> Although I did hear from a friend who goes to Cuba a lot and knows many of the official officials um, that someone uh, said to her when it first came out, I thought she was our friend. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, the, did he only read half the book? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of... Um, I, j I just try and be as true to my observations and what people tell me and so on as, as possible. So um, y there's no one you can write for, I, I mean, specifically. You know, you just have to be true. T you have to write in service of your story, mm. not, not for any reactions from any particular people, Fidel included. <laughs> well, I would be curious. What am I reading? Um, I'm actually uh, reading a few different things, but uh, I'm reading this memoir um, that Jung did, that he dictated to his secretary. I'm forgetting the name of it. It's probably in my bag there. Um, like Dreams, Memories, and something. That someone else might know the title here. Um, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, um, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of that now, and. Um, um, I'm reading uh, Louise Gluck's 
poetry and I'm reading um, uh, I'm reading this book about uh, I'm forgetting the author but it was really a compilation of voices from World War II memories so uh, sort of a first-hand accounts it's a combination it's uh, you know I guess it's not atypical to uh, am, I, am I reading any I don't think I'm reading any fiction right at the moment yeah what are you reading Oh, okay, 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 good, yeah, all right, so you have a recommendation here, girl waits for sky, it's an excellent other question from there in the back. Um, there's usually at least a Cuban or two floating around on the periphery, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, in a handbook to luck, uh, there there was one Cuban thread through it, but I, there were Iranians in that book and Salvadorans, you know, as main characters. Um, in uh, Monkey Hunting, I had a, a a lot of that book is set in 19th century Cuba, colonial Cuba, and and uh, the protagonist there is actually a, ch a fellow from China who ended up conscripted. I'm not exactly conscripted. He he signed one of those eight-year contracts to go work in Cuba sugarcane fields and remain. So, so I have a, I have him. Um, yeah, I know I have other people. And then this book is a lot a lot of Germans, obviously Germans, but some Cubans, some Poles, and Russians. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> I'm glad they didn't say Slovenia because I've never written about Slovenia. So, I, you know, you can never trust journalists. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. So, you began your career with public writer composition with some very loud voices in your own head, and then you got some big criticisms um, with some of these. And I'm wondering uh, what sort of advice you would have for new students to write in general about taking things into account and taking things into account in class, taking things into research and in your college career. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that we we do in our in our class is that we generally break up into smaller groups so that uh, it's a it's a it's a way to resist consensus. I think we were were we doing that at that time? Maybe no. not yet. No, it's something I started doing about five or six years ago. And so every um, every author uh, who submits a piece in our class will get at least the at least the opinion of two different groups, two small groups, and then get the opinion of the other author who hasn't heard what's been said. And then I usually kind of chime in at the end. So there's lots of different layers. And I think it's very instructive to find that, because usually within the groups, I think it's quite natural for many consensus to form. And so, but, so I, th but I think it's very instructive um, to hear that these radically different opinions on the same subject. And sometimes we'll break up into three groups if there are three stories, and always new things come up from group to group. And, um, and I generally tell writers to don't go rushing home to incorporate every single thing you hear. You know, let it sift out. Pay close attention after time to what deeply resonates, that you, as a writer, are the ultimate arbiter of your own work. Uh, you can get s feedback and uh, valuable feedback, um, uh, but, but ultimately it's up to you. What stays, what remains on the page, what moves forward, completely depends on you. And so to be very, very selective, uh, I mean, listen to everything, but be very selective about what you actually incorporate, I think, so that you don't lose yourself, you don't lose your, your distinctive voice. Yeah. I think it's probably uh, t 
technique I used when I was a, a journalist, but also uh, at one point as the mother of a teenage daughter, <laughs> um, which is very open-ended questions. Nothing that feels like you're trying to lead the witness, nothing that feels like you you've already have a preordained conclusion about something uh, and you're just trying to confirm it, uh, and a genuine curiosity. Um, and so, uh, gen I often will just start with something very open-ended. So what is your day like? Or so something that doesn't feel like they're trapped, something that they can talk about easily and, and get warmed up with, and then that will often lead to other, uh, you know, kind of other, other revelations, maybe more personal, more intimate. Um, my, my class read uh, Primo Levi's uh, periodic table for this week, and one of the quotes in there was um, something like, uh, uh, I am someone to whom stories are told. You, you want to be that person. You want to be that place where people um, feel safe telling, telling you their tales. And it's incredible what people will tell you. I was once minding my business in the swimming pool of my parents' condo in Florida when this woman swims over at me with one of those very elaborate headdressy uh, apron caps. And I see her approaching, you know, very baroquely. <laughs> And and uh, and she ended up. She goes, I, me, I don't know why, but I want to tell. You. She ended up telling me this incredible story about her bigamist ex-husband, who had a family in Kentucky and a family in Ohio. I think she was the Ohio portion. This went on for twenty years, and I'm sitting there like slack jawed, <laughs> you know, as the chlorine is is <laughs> the fumes are just. But this is the kind of thing. I don't know if it happens to you, but people tell me stories all the time. I couldn't even begin to write up all the stories I'm, um, I'm told. But I also think it's just a general, you know, you're, you listen, you're, you're, you're patient, you're curious more than anything, and you're not constantly looking down at your device and being anywhere but here. You know, there's a present tenseness. There's a quality. There's, a, I think, a poetry to listening that people f forget exists. Um, so it's not just uh, the quality of the writing, it's the quality of your, your listening that leads to the quality of your observation and, and the honing of your sensibilities, I think. Would you mind just speaking a little bit louder, please? general process. I think, um, you know, I, I often will start with a kind of vague notion. Like when I went to Berlin, I thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to Berlin because I, I had this idea for this sort of triptych of a novel where I would be doing research and trying to find evidence of Cuba's uh, adventurism in the world. You know, Cuba had a long relationship with the Soviet bloc in, in you know, Eastern Europe, etc., and Berlin, and sent many of its, uh, many of its young students to study. I had an uncle who studied in Moscow, uh, who, his first of many wives was Russian. Um, you know, things like that. And, I, and, to my and, and, uh, and so I went to Berlin trying to look for traces of that. What was left in 2013 of that long uh, and, and complicated relationship? And, um, but when I got there, I didn't find as much as I thought. Um, I was intrigued because a friend of mine said he had reconstituted his grandmother's entire Spanish library from the book stalls outside the Bode Museum, you know, in, in Berlin. I'm like, how is that possible? He goes, no, there was a big fire sale in the 90s. Like, you know, entire libraries ended up in Germany and in Berlin. I, I, this was too fantastic for me. So, but I kept, I heard other stories. And, and so I went there with one idea and then the entire project got derailed, got hijacked by Berlin itself and its archaeologies and its, um, and uh, probably the big turning point for me was going to this uh, German-Russian museum in Karlshorst, which is way east of the city, and, and discovering for the first time all this information in archival material on the Eastern Front that has, has finally been opening up since 1990 uh, to the world. Um, so. So all of these things, 
uh, completely changed this plan. And so I, I think you go in with intentions and uh, so, you know, certain intentions, but you have to be willing to be seduced in many different directions. But always op open to seduction. <laughs> Nestor, hi. <laughs> I didn't plan this collection of voices, although obviously in King of Cuba, all these little voices started coming out. Uh, you know, this almost in this or the overall effect is almost orchestral. I think I hope, um, but no, I, I really was I was trying to look for evidence, as I told you, but also of uh, immersing myself in that history, but seeing if some character would emerge from from that history. That wh whose tale I could follow, make up, uh, embroider, whatever. And um, but I heard I heard too many stories to to settle on one. And so it 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 just happened very organically. It was this is not this is uh, I, I really I, I don't I feel definitely in the orchestra pit on this one. You know I did, didn't I didn't see it coming the the way this happened. And um, there are a few Cubans. There's I opened the book with um, that. One of the sto little stories I didn't read tonight about um, a young uh, Cuban guy. He's 16 years old. He's he's a night watchman uh, on the very eastern coast of Cuba, and he gets kidnapped one night by um, German seamen off a U-boat. Who they came up, they came on shore secretly to get a few pineapples, maybe a thing of rum, and before you know it, this guy's eight months on this U-boat. Now I made up that story, but it came from a story I did hear of of a Virginian who was kidnapped by a German U-boat during the middle of World War II, and that sometimes they did land, they did sneak ashore and did these kinds of things. So I thought, oh, let me go to Cuba. Let's take, let's take this guy. Um, you know, so, so a every, every story um, emerges from my history or talking to people or all based on kernels of truth that then just get, you know, popped into craziness. Well, in my imag my overheated and canola oiled imagination here, <laughs> extra salt. Are we good? Yeah. One last question. Ichi. Um, how about you in the back? Do you have a mic? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if there was a difference in Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I tend to do quite a bit of research, you know, um, just because I like to know my terrain. And I often, and I guess this goes back to my uh, journalist days, but I, I often w will travel. And I mean, there uh, for monkey hunting, for example, before it was hijacked to the 19th century, I thought most of it would be taking place in Vietnam. And so I went to Vietnam for a month with my four-year-old. And we, we went around because I wanted to see all the all the sites of the major battles and you know all kinds of things. So for me, th that sensory input is is very important. I felt like I couldn't have finished King of Cuba without going back to Cuba and again just getting all that that real you know texture, smells, sounds, tastes. You know, I I think um, uh, I I think that that sensory per parade. That sensory procession is so important um, in a book. Uh, to me, it's more than an intellectual exercise. You know, it's a, it's about um, engaging all the senses in 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 the kind of gorgeous distortions they're they're from. So as we get ready to close for the evening, I wanted to ask you about your ending. How do you know when you have reached your re resonant ending? Uh, yeah. I, I um, the, for King of Cuba, oh, it was the worst ever. <laughs> I do know, I think I wrote that ending more than I did any other part of the book, and I'm still not 100% satisfied with it. Um, 
I don't know, other endings feel fine, like Jamie and Cuban ending feels good, you know, ambiguous and so on. I, I don't know, I think you, m my sense is that you want, for me, a perfect ending is an ending where um, you can imagine the story going on. In other words, there's enough imaginative fuel to continue the story but the frame feels just right. You're, ha you're happy and satisfied with where it goes, but it still gives you a lot to, to ponder and that you as the reader, for me, my favorite books, and I as the reader can continue the story. Wonder if it, what if it, this happened or that happened? So yes, as a writer, you're, you're framing it, but the story presumably started before it began and continues afterwards and that, and that you're creating a world that will incite that kind of ongoing speculation. I mean, I, th I think about books I read 20 years ago still um, sometimes, don't you? Yeah. Are you open to trying to come back? And yeah, sure. I could sign some books and um, continue the conversation outside. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>